These kind of songs are always motivating to me. Uh, there is nothing that will prepare you to preach the gospel better uh, than a song such as that to think of the magnificence of he to whom we are coming to bow before. <laughs> God is the great I am. God Almighty is he that we are coming before this morning to worship. He is not our peer. He is not our buddy. He is the Almighty God. In Isaiah chapter 6, for just a moment, just to set the stage, it says, In the year the king as I died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high, lifted up in his train, filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. And which way he covered his face? And which way he covered his feet? And which way he did fly? And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 Jehovah of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook of the boy at the voice of him which cried. There was such fervency in the cries of the seraphim that the building was shaking its very foundations, folks. We are coming before the Almighty God. The seraphim who are so mighty and wonderful, they cover their face and feet in his presence, and yet you would have some pray to him as if he is his peer. This is the Almighty God, and we ought to tremble at the thought of it. How great thou art. Amen. This morning we're going to talk about James. Brother Jerry has done a fantastic job in the book of James. I'm learning a lot and I, I hope that you are as well. If not, you're not paying attention. We are learning a lot in this class. Faith is a, a prevalent theme in the book of James. James was the brother of the Lord and James actually identified himself more rather than the brother of his Lord. He said, I am a servant of Christ. What an attitude. Who better to illustrate the submissive obedience of faith than the brother of the Lord who didn't even identify himself as the brother of the Lord. Rather a servant of Christ. Faith is prevalent in the book of James, isn't it? We've been studying that. We understand that. You can see it in, in, in every word. You can see it in every verse. We won't go into every verse. We'll just do a, a relatively brief outline of some of these things. But I believe they'll be beneficial to you and they'll refresh your memory on what we've already We've already studied, and it'll look, give us something to look forward to as we continue in chapter 5. Faith. The world has something to say about faith. I've done a Webster's Dictionary search of the word faith one time, and it said basically, the belief in something without any evidence. But that's not faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1 says, For faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen, the American Standard would say. It is conviction and assurance. Now that doesn't sound like a leap in the dark to me. In Isaiah chapter 43, the Lord speaking to the children of Israel would say, That you may know me and understand me, and, uh, and uh, excuse me, believe me and understand that I am He. God had given them enough evidence that they could draw a reasonable and rational conclusion. That's faith. Based foursquare upon, thus saith the Lord. That's faith. The Lord speaks. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, as young Samuel was coming up, and he was in the temple, and he heard the voice of the Lord crying unto him, and he was told to say this, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth thee. That's faith. Ready, willing, eager to follow the commands of God, and waited on bated breath just to hear those lovely words. Is that how we think of this? Is that how we think of this book? I'm guilty, and I'm sure you are. During my daily readings of my, the Bible, the, the New Testament that I read through once in a month, you know that sometimes I will go through and I will read just for the sake of reading. Shame on me. I'm not afraid to tell you that because we're ever learning and growing. That's something that I'm changing my mind about. I can't do that. I've got to read this as if it were a love letter. Remember we said that one time? How many of us in here are missing mothers or fathers or brothers or sisters or sons or daughters? What if you could just have one more letter from your dad? How would you read it? Would you pay attention to every word? Or would you just skim over it and get to the meaty parts? Folks, this is our guide. This is going to get us to heaven if we study and apply it. We have to study this with some conviction. We have to study this with some purpose. So let's do that. And let's do that together this morning. Paul would say to Timothy... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 
Peter would say something similar in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, that we have all things that pertain to life and, and godliness through knowledge of Him, and that, of course, is Jesus. We have what we need, and it equips us thoroughly for these trials and tribulations that we face. Faith is displayed in the book of James. Follow along with me, please, again. Uh, as I always say, prove me. Make sure that everything I say is as it ought to be. You've got an outline, follow that. But way more important than that outline is your Bible. Open that Bible and follow along with me this morning. Let's begin. Verses 2 through 4 in chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Isn't it an interesting concept that the trials and tribulations that we face, you know, uh, when, that, when that says temptations, that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, well, I'm just tempted, I'm tempted to do something, something is tempting me. That has a greater meaning. It means trials. It means persecution. It means also temptation. It's a, it's a bigger word than just that thought. So it encompasses more than that, than just, oh, I'm tempted to give in to this. It's more than that. When we face these things, Oh, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. That's what the Lord said in Matthew 6. We are able to be delivered from temptation, aren't we? We are, but, but when we face these trials and these persecutions, we ought not to look at them as, oh, it's a detriment to me, but actually it's not. You know, uh, what doesn't kill us makes us what? Stronger. And when we learn from these trials, you know, I was going through this and I just felt like, that the, my life was over. There is no possible way I can get through this. But you know what? Somehow you did. Can we, can we not learn from that? Is that not something that would benefit us in our spiritual journey from earth to heaven? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the, the benefits of suffering? Brother, Brother Thomas Warren did a, he wrote a book. If you don't have a book, I got a copy. And I'd recommend you get it. It's basically, it's, it's, it's titled as, Have the Atheist Proved That There Is No God? Basically, and, and I might be wrong on that, but it's basically, that's the, the, the premise of it. And what he goes, he goes about and he establishes that the accusations regarding suffering, well, if there is a God, why do we suffer? Rather than proving the point that there is no God, it actually does the opposite. It actually proves the point that, the, that there is a God. And if everything was, was in this life was just hunky-dory and there were no conflicts and there were no problems, then, then how would we ever prove ourselves? That's a valid point, isn't it? The sufferings of this life prepare us and allow us to demonstrate our faith in God. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have our perfect work that you may be perfect. Now, can you be or can't you be? Can you be complete? Can your trials and tribulations not help you grow to such a degree as that you are a mature, full-blown Christian man? Yes or no? Yes. Now, is that beneficial to you on your journey from earth to heaven? You're not going to get there without. Beginning in verse 12 of the same chapter, we'd say, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. If what? If he endures. Which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. Have you ever heard that? Why would God do this? Why would God take him away from me? Why would God take my dad? Why would God take my mother? Why would God take my wife? He didn't take him away. That's not the Lord's doing. Oh, I'm tempted of God. Why would, why would God put me in such a situation? You put yourself in this situation. Why the Lord would the Lord put me in? Oh, he, why would I be in prison now? Oh, the Lord has guided me. Oh, have you ever heard anybody say, well, it was meant to be? You know, there's an expression. It's not, it's not very politically correct. But some things, uh, some things, you know, everything happens for a reason. You know, the reason sometimes is because you make foolish decisions. Why will the Lord let me to prison? Did he? Well, you just got drunk and ran somebody over and now they're dead and, and you're in prison. But that was the Lord's will, right? That is foolishness. If it was meant to be, I guess the 50 million babies that have been aborted, oh, well, they just didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. What, what a silly concept. We have to be accountable for ourselves. 
Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted with God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away. By what? Of his own lust. And why did Adam sin? Why did Eve sin? Why? Because there was a choice to be made, and there was a temptation. A choice, of course, uh, free will implies a choice, right? If, if there's no free will, then there, the, if there's no choice, there's no free will. So there has to be a choice. Thus, man has always been under law. Of course he has. So here is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Of every tree of the garden may shall freely eat except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's law. So there's a temptation. Yes, Eve was beguiled. Eve was deceived. Yes, she was. But she gave in to her own lust. Do you know why? She wanted to be like God. Satan said, if you eat of this, you'll know both good and evil. You will be like unto God. It wasn't enough for her to, to be in humble submission to the authority. She wanted a part of this herself. She gave in the temptation. And of course, Adam did also. Did they sin because they were sinners? That's absurd. They sin because they were tempted and they gave in to it. That's why. Why do you sin today? Because you're tempted and you give in to it. If you live a constant life of sin, guess what? By definition, you're a sinner. Colossians 3, verse 7. Very simple. So, neither tempted thee any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and he's enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. We can endure, can't we? Well, there's just, there's, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty strong in most areas, but there's just one or two things that just really get me. Well, can you or can you not work on those little things? Nod your head. Yes, you can. Is it not possible to strengthen yourself? We learned that this morning. Were y'all paying attention in James' class? We can be strengthened through these. We can grow through these things. And then it becomes easier to face it. Have you ever had this thought in mind when you're tempted to do something wrong? My sin nailed to the cross. You know, I wish I had that thought in mind back in the day when I was doing my terrible things. I wish I thought of that. I did. Live and learn, right? But now, do you think that that can't be some, some motivation not to go back and do the same things before? I'm not nailing him to that cross afresh. No, sir, not me, not today. That's powerful motivation. That's growing. That's learning. And that's, that's, that's uh, strengthening yourself to where you won't give in to these things. Blessed is a man that endures temptation. Faith is displayed by enduring trials because a person trusts in God and remains steadfast even when it is difficult. Now, what's the easy thing? What's the easy thing to do for us today in society in the United States? To go along with the flow. That is, hey, that's okay. Homosexual marriage, no big deal. Hey, it's okay if, if you want to, to live in adultery, no big deal. Oh, you're married several times? Hey, everybody does it. That's the easy thing. What happens when you oppose that? Oh, wait a minute. You're, a little, you're one of those religious people, aren't you? You're a little weird. You need to get with the times. Well, the Lord said in Titus chapter 2 that we are peculiar people, zealous of good works. And, you know, I, I think back to Elijah, and I think back to uh, him being surrounded by that army, and that servant is with him, and, and that servant is distraught. And, a, and, the, and the prophet says, you know what? Take it easy, for there are more with us than there are with them. Mm -hmm. And he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord opened his eyes, and there were the chariots of fire. The Lord and his army of hosts are on our side. What can man do for me? Powerful, isn't it? It's powerful if we think of it that way. Can't that motivate us to overcome trials? Can't that motivate us to stand out in a community? Can't that motivate us to stand for truth even when it's hard? Jesus did. Can you imagine being led to the hands of these men? Him just as innocent as he can be and he never once sinned. He, he never once gave in. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. You know what? If it'll get me out of this, yep, you got it. No, he never did it. Never once did he do that. Enduring difficulty shows trust in God. 1 Peter 2. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when you're buffeted for your own faults, you shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently? For this is acceptable with God. For even here too were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who didn't know God, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53. What a wonderful example. 
You mean to tell me that when I, hey, I didn't do this and you're persecuting me for it, you shouldn't retaliate? It's thankworthy toward God if you just suffer, suffer a little bit. It's going to be good for you. You'll learn, you'll grow. All right, what about this one? You know, some of our Baptist friends don't like this. That's okay. I'm not here to please the Baptist, am I? I'm here to please God. You know, James, when he translated, excuse me, uh, Mark Luther, when he translated his New Testament, he didn't even translate the book of James. Why? Well, it's detrimental to my doctrine. Well, then maybe you need a new doctrine. You ever think of that? Because James' word is inspired of God in 2 Timothy 3.16. By being a doer of the word, we, we express or display our faith. The word is able to save our souls. Thus, faith obeys the gospel. Romans 1.5, the obedience of faith. Romans 1.16.17, 17, the gospel is God's power to save. Notice James 1.21 and 22. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not ears only, deceiving your own selves. So much for faith only. So much for belief only. James dealt a death blow. Now do you wonder why that Martin Luther didn't like this book? Because it was, it was contradicting his teachings. Being a doer of the word results in some things. Verse 18 of James chapter 1 says, Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How are we begotten now? What is the new birth? Is that really so mysterious in the New Testament? John 3, 3-5. Three through five. Nicodemus didn't seem to understand it. Well, Nicodemus had a preconceived notion in his mind regarding his lineage, physical descendant, uh, being a part of the family of God. Jesus was correcting that and saying it, it needs to be a spiritual dependency, a spiritual family. Thus, the new birth is spiritual. This is the new birth. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth. That's exactly what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Begotten by the word. That's the same thing Titus says in Titus 3, 5. That we have, uh, we have been renewed by the Holy Ghost. It's the same concept. Verse 25. He that continues therein. This shows that this is not only obedience initially, but continually. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. That you must continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. What happens if you continue in the faith? Has anyone... All the times I've quoted this, has anyone memorized Colossians 1, 21, 22, and 23? All right, it says basically that you are, uh, that you are unrebukable, that, you're, that you are unblameable, that you are without blemish before God, if so be that you continue in the faith. So, that is the exact same thing that John said in 1 John 1, 7 and 9. That if you walk in the light, it's the exact same thing Paul said in Romans 8, verse 1. That there is no condemnation to those in Christ who walk after the Spirit. Spirit rather than after the flesh. What about this one? We display our faith in God by practicing pure religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. To keep himself unspotted from the world. Why? We'll see in just a moment in chapter 2 it says. Uh, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5 and that's what James is going to reference. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Who in this world that we live in is more in need of care, compassion, protection, and mercy than fatherless children and the elderly? The widows, the woman who has been loyal to her husband all of her life and her husband passes away and now she is all by herself. Who is in more need of protection, care, and comfort? Pure religion and other Bible before the world is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Visit, care for. We are to support when necessary. Can the church support a widow? Yes. Can the church support an orphan? Yes. Can we individually support a widow? Yes. Can we individually support an orphan? Yes. Can we, as a congregation, practice pure and undefiled religion? Yes, we can. True religion is, is exemplified by compassion towards others. Would we really be heeding the teachings of Jesus to be merciful to others, to love our enemies, to do good to all of these individuals if we neglect widows and orphans? Are we really expressing, demonstrating true religion? No, we're not. Notice how, or notice who, we are to be compassionate towards. 
In Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse number 30, the Lord reveals this. He says this. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went into him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an end and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Go and do thou likewise to your brethren only. False. Go and do thou likewise only to those of the same social status. False. Go and do thou likewise to anyone that you would be merciful towards. True. Who's our neighbor? I think some of our brethren need to learn this lesson. Our neighbor is anyone that he would, we would be merciful to. And there is no limit to who we can be merciful to. What about this one? We display our faith when we are not a respecter of persons. Beginning in chapter uh, 2 and verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and saith to him, Sit thou here in the good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not partial then in yourselves? Are ye become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Doth not the rich man oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that holy name by which you're called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. This is one of the most powerful statements, I think. This very chapter, chapter 2, is so incredibly powerful. These first nine verses, and then as we transition into what we're going to study in just a minute, regarding being merciful. Do you know that he's going to sum up in chapter 2, verses 18 through 26, and he is going to say that faith demonstrates itself in action. And he's going to use one, one example. And I remember when, when Jerry was teaching his class. One example. If you see a brother, and he is naked, and he is destitute of food, and you say, be well, be warmed and filled, and you send him on your way, your belief that he needs it has done absolutely nothing for him. The only way that you can do anything about it is if your belief that he needs it motivates you to provide it. Isn't that powerful? Oh, well, I know you're hungry, and I know you're poor, and I know you don't have any clothes, and I know nobody loves you, and you don't have anybody in this world, but have a nice day, I'm busy. That's terrible. That breaks your heart even thinking about it. No, it should be, brother, I love you and I'm going to show you I love you. Let me go get you something to eat. Let me buy you a coat so that you're not cold. That's love. That's faith. That's trust in God. That's demonstrating your love and compassion for others and your adherence to his teachings. True religion is exemplified by not showing partiality to the rich and powerful. What are the motives for favoring the rich and powerful, if not a hope of some sort of gain from it? In Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, it says, Then said he also to him that bade them, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made unto thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. How many of us actually have this kind of a heart? Have you ever done something for someone that there's no way they could have ever repaid you? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Well, I'm going to do this for so-and-so because I'm going to, he's going to pay me back. I'm going to do this for, for this individual because he's influential. What about the man that actually needs it? He's, he's hungry. Are you going to provide for him? Because he, he can never repay you. What's our motivation? 
Should that motivate motivate us, motivate us? Excuse me, to be more benevolent, to be to be more compassionate towards others. By being merciful, we display our faith in God. We will only obtain mercy if we're if we're merciful. You know, I remember reading. Uh, no, excuse me, not reading. Growing up, watching all these movies, and I watched the Karate Kid. And you know, the Karate Kid. Uh, when this instructor for the Cobra Kai, he was a bad guy. He wasn't very nice. And he said, mercy's for the weak. I remember him saying that. He says, no mercy. You go out there and beat this kid up. No mercy. It just sticks out of my mind as that's a prevalent thought in today's society. Mercy displays weakness. Well, that's not true, is it? That's not true at all. Uh, for we shall have judgment without mercy that hath shown no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart me in peace and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding he give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Don't you dare remove verse 17 from that context. Don't you dare do it. You know why? Because it's going to teach you something. Your faith only, your belief only, that doesn't motivate you to act is just as worthless as believing your brother is starving to death and you do nothing to feed him. Now, if that isn't an illustration and if it isn't powerful, correct me and I'll be right back there when this lesson's over. That stood out to me when Brother Jerry taught that. That stood out to me and it still stands out in my mind. Faith without works is worthless. Do we understand that we have been forgiven of an unpayable debt? Who are we not to forgive others? You know, as, as you turn, if you want to turn to Matthew 28, as you turn there, let me, let me let you think about something. In Luke chapter 7, the Lord is speaking in Simon's house, and he, he has this woman who was there. And this woman was, as soon as he came in, she anointed his feet with oil, and she began to kiss, kiss his feet, and she would wipe his feet with, with her hair. And the Lord would ask Simon something. He basically asked him, Simon, let me ask you something. To whom will love more? He that is forgiven of much or he that is forgiven of little? And he says, I assume that he that is forgiven of much will love more. And he says, Thou hast spoken rightly. How much have you been forgiven of? I've been forgiven of a lot. I've probably been forgiven of more than a lot of folks. We have been forgiven of an unpayable debt. We have been forgiven of an unpayable debt, a debt we can never possibly work off. A debt we can never possibly repay. Never. Who are we to withhold mercy? God. Listen to this. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Depending on which figure you use, a talent weighs about 75 pounds. A talent of gold is worth, obviously, a lot of money. Imagine 10,000. Imagine a debt that could, you couldn't even ever scratch the surface of. That is the debt owed. This parable, of course, the deeper meaning of it, not just the, 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 the superficial meaning, the deeper meaning of this parable is we have been forgiven of an unpayable debt. There is not one person on this earth who has been forgiven that has been forgiven of an unpayable debt. It doesn't matter how many sins because you can't forgive one sin. God can forgive sin, and he only forgives sin through the blood of Christ. Therefore, one sin is unpayable. Imagine a lifetime of sin. Imagine years and years and years of sin. You can't possibly pay it back. And for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. It, when he sold these things, it wouldn't, even, it wouldn't even put a dent in what he owed. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. <clears throat> That's what God does to us when we obey the gospel. He looses us. He forgives us. Revelation 1 verse 5. He hath loosed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, who are we that have been forgiven not to forgive others? Let me put an asterisk here. You only forgive those who are willing to repent. But that doesn't mean that we don't go to them and try to urge them to repent. Luke 17, verse 3. So this debtor goes, and he goes down to his, his servant, and this servant owes him 100 pence. Nothing. And he gets angry with him, and he throws him in jail until he pays everything. 
And then the Lord comes back and puts this guy in jail until he pays every dime. Don't you dare withhold forgiveness to others when you've been forgiven. Forgiveness is always, in any case, forgiveness is predicated upon the humility to repent. If a brother or sister is, uh, is not a penitent towards the things that they've done towards you, then you've tried to bring this reconciliation about. See Matthew 18. At some point, you withdraw yourself from this guy. That's what you're supposed to do. You don't have to forgive them if they make no efforts to repent, but you're supposed to be in a disposition where you're eager to forgive if only they would repent. And you even go about to try to bring it about. That's by going to them. We better be merciful, folks. What about obedience? James 2, 18 through 26. Yea, a man might say, wait a minute. What, what verse is this? 18. What did we just read a minute ago? Then stop and I said, don't you dare take verse 17 out of there? Regarding that hungry brother. You remember that? This is the very next verse. Yea, a man might say, thou hast faith that I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. I believe you're hungry, brother. I'm going to do something about it. I believe God said I had to obey the gospel. I'm going to do something about it. I believe I'm in sin and I need, to be, I need to be forgiven. I'm going to repent of my sin. I already believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm going to let someone immerse me for the remission of my sins so that I can be added to the one and only church. That's faith in action. And you can't be saved without it. Any faith not expressed in obedience is worthless. Genesis 22. Abraham, get thee up unto a mountain which I will show of thee. And what are you going to do there, Abraham? You're going to offer your son. Verse 3 says, and Abraham went. Genesis chapter 6. By faith Noah. Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith Noah, dot, 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 prepared. Genesis 6.22 says, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's faith. That is faith in action. Hebrews 11 4. By faith Abel offered. By faith, Abraham obeyed, Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham offered, Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell, Hebrews 11, verse 30. Faith comes by hearing the word, Romans 10, 8, Romans 10, 17. Our obedience to God is trusting in Him. That's faith. What about this one? Faith is expressed by controlling the tongue. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. We put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. We turn their whole body. The ships, though they be so great and driven in the fierce winds, they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listens. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindled. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue is among our members. It defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire uh, the fire of hell. How powerful is the tongue? You could be a man that is uh, meek and lowly and patient. You can express that in, in action. Uh, and, and this man is never going to be rash with his tongue. Or you can have somebody that's, that uh, says one thing and then he turns around and, and he's gossiping and he's kindling a little fire. Running that mouth. Isn't he? Kindling a fire with that tongue. Which one of these men, the patient, humility, uh, humble human being who is uh, very careful in what he says, which one of these is more apt to control his tongue? Of course, the, the, the humble one. You know, the tongue, uh, uh, we were talking about that even this morning again in the James class. How easy it is just to blurt something out. Oh, you've done something to me, I'm going to get you back. Listen to this. Ooh, wait a minute. We better be careful. If a man controls his tongue, this man is in control of himself. And that's not easy, is it? Those are few and far between, aren't they? You, I think of these men as being these folks that use great discretion and they never answer rashly. And, and someone says something to them and they just take it in stride and they go about their business and they come back to them later and say, you know, I thought about that. And, and, and I thought carefully about what I want to say and here's what I would like to present to you. Now, what's wrong with that? If only I could be that man. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm working on it. It's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Especially for someone with a personality like me. It's just not easy. But I've got to humble myself, don't they? And I've got to, to do better. It's something we all have to struggle with. A man that controls his tongue is a man. Indeed. If any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own self, this man's religion is vain. Ooh, that's powerful, folks. 
Oh, Eric, you say this. Oh, you teach that. Oh, you study this. Oh, you do that. But you run your mouth just like anybody else. Then your religion is just as vain and worthless as these other folks. True or false? That's true. You better be careful. Faith is displayed by controlling oneself. Rather than a rash reaction, patience is exercised and the tongue is controlled. Can a blessing and cursing come from the same mouth? Oh, I love the Lord, but I hate Him. Oh, I'm going to church today. Then when you get there, all you're going to do is gossip. Simple question. Can sweet water and bitter come from the same fountain? Boy, James got a way of words. Isn't he? He's powerful. This inspired document is powerful. What about this one? Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Two choices. I want to be a friend of the world, enemy of God. I want to be a friend of God, enemy of the world. Which way is it going to be? There's no middle ground. It's got to be one or the other. Romans 6, 16 through 18. You can't have it any other way. If you're going to be friends with the world, you are the enemy of God, period. If you're going to go and follow a multitude to do evil, if you're going to stand with your family who are living in constant unrebellion sin, then you are opposed to God. Just admit it. Don't try to play both sides because you're not fooling God. We're supposed to be different, aren't we? You mean to tell me that a Christian could be just like everybody else in the world? If I, if I saw your actions over a week, you are no different from anybody else? Guess what? You're not a Christian. Hello, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. Hereby we do know that we know we love him if we keep his commandments. Oh, I'm a Christian, verse 4. You're a liar because you're not living it. 1 John 1, 6 says it too. You cannot be friends with the world and also be friends with God. Romans 6. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey to the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness of the sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 16 says, Know ye not? That to whom you submit yourself servants to obey, ye servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. How many fingers I got up here? Two. Two choices. Sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness. There is no middle ground. By doing good. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's a sin. Do you know you're supposed to do good? What happens when you fail? You sin. I'll be right back there when this lesson's over with. Anybody wants to disagree with me, that's okay. Bring me some scripture. Well, I know I'm supposed to do this. But I'm not going to. Sin. Is sin a big deal? Sin is an affront to God. Sin is an affront to the holiness of God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, what happens when you sin? You separate yourself. Is that a big deal? Is it a big deal being out of fellowship with the one who can, who can save your soul? That's a pretty big deal. It involves making a choice to do right above all else. Colossians 3, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Mortify, therefore, your members, verse 5. That means put them to death, right? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We're supposed to be different than we used to be. We have a choice to make. we got to do good, right? You also can't violate your own conscience without sin. Uh, Romans 14, 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he that eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Well... I don't really think I ought to be eating it, even though there's nothing specifically wrong with it. I just don't feel like I should eat it. Eat it. Okay, I'll eat it anyway. Sin. You can't violate your conscience. If you don't think something's right, don't do it. It doesn't matter if it's lawful. Don't do it. Nobody says you have to eat that, right? That's what Romans 14 is about. The Jew couldn't buy the Gentile that he had to eat of the law, and the Gentile couldn't buy the Jew that he didn't have to. you got to have a little liberty for the weaker, Right? What about this? By asking in faith. Yeah, that's in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, but we're going to tie it into the end of the chapter in chapter 5. By asking in faith, only the obedient can petition God and have assurance that that prayer is going to be answered. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears under their supplication. 
But the face of the Lord is upon them to do evil. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are open unto the prayers of the righteous. 1 Peter 3, 12. James 5, 16 and 17 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray you one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Why does he say that? Do you remember who was in charge when Elijah did this? Ahab. King Ahab was in charge. He was a very good guy, wasn't he? Why is he saying that the prayer of the righteous avails much? And now he says, listen to this. Look at the example of the prophet. What did he do? He prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. Did it rain for three and a half years? What does that tell you? That God hears the prayer of the faithful and he will hearken. If that's not what's being taught here, please someone enlighten me. Of course that's what's being taught. James 5. We display our faith by being patient. <clears throat> verse 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Then he says it again in verse 8. Be ye also patient and establish your hearts. Patience is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, that's long-suffering. To them who by patient continuous and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. Romans 2.7. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the people minded, support the weak, and be patient towards all men. Patience displays something. It displays, it displays trust in God. You trust in Him that can get you through all these things. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Psalm 125 and verse 1. Faith displayed in action converts sinners. This speaks to our great love and concern for our fellow man, Ephesians 4.15. When the faith will depart from the faith, 1 Timothy 4.1, we ought to correct them and bring them back. Verses 19 and 20 of James 5 says, Brethren, if any of you, who's he talking to? Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, can you err from the truth if you were never in the truth? And one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner, who's the sinner? Him that departed from the truth. From the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. We display our faith when we show love and compassion for others by correcting them, don't we? What about those who've never obeyed the gospel? We should do the same thing. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, have to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And God peradventure will give them repentance through the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Let us strive to display our faith in the ways in which James has described. If we're not doing it, we ought to. If we're doing it a little but not enough, we ought to strive to do better. This invitation is going to be offered to those who've never obeyed the gospel as well as those who need to come back to the truth. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you must hear the word of God. You must believe it. You must repent of your sins. You must confess Christ before men. And you must be baptized for the remission of sins. And you must continue to be faithful all of your life. For those who have obeyed the gospel, what if you realize today that you are not displaying your faith quite as you ought to be? Change your mind about it. Set your will to do better and do better. Change your mind. Repent of those things. Acknowledge your failures to God and He will forgive you. And if you need us to pray with you for you, we'll be happy to do so. As we sing this invitation song, please examine yourselves. We beseech you, therefore, on behalf of Christ. Be ye reconciled to God right now as we stand and sing. God is calling the prodigal. Come without delay. Here